We're talking about the benefits of sermon-based study groups this week on the Church Revitalization Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Church Revitalization Podcast, brought to you by the Malfers Group team, where each week we tackle important, actionable topics to help churches thrive. And now, here's your hosts, Scott Ball and A.J. Matthew. Welcome to the Church Revitalization Podcast. My name is Scott Ball. I'm joined by my friend and co-host, A.J. Matthew. And when I say joined by, uh, we are both, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, you'll notice there's some different backgrounds to to where A.J. and I are each this week. Um, <clears throat> and also, we may sound a little different than uh, than we normally do. We're we're on the road, so I'm actually in Madrid right now. The sun is rising behind me here in my uh, hotel. AJ, even though we are in the same time zone, you're a little bit further east than I am in Italy, Italia, and so the sun is already well up for you. So it's a beautiful um, day in Naples this morning. <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, we're here working with uh, two different churches, and uh, rarely are we both on the road at the same time. So it's kind of a, a fun thing. We thought, ah, oh, let's do the podcast on the road this week. But and uh, shout out any- to uh, to our certified guide Andrea, also based in Europe, and uh, mm-hmm. able to uh, work with you uh, at the Church of Madrid. So three of us out yeah. um, on the road in Europe this week. Yeah. That's right. Absolutely right. So uh, today we're going to be talking about the benefits of uh, sermon-based groups, um, sermon-based discussion and study. Um, uh, Before we dive into that, uh, I first want to remind you, if you've not yet signed up for our launch event for the Healthy Churches Toolkit that is coming up on October 15th, please go sign up there at malfirstgroup.com forward slash launch. You're going to hear um, maybe a little bit today of some of the, the features of the toolkit, but um, a lot about the toolkit at that event. You're going to see all of the, the, the features and benefits and the tools and the resources and how it's really going to make your life as a church leader so much better and so much easier. Uh, and of course, our, our, our best ever uh, pricing we'll have at that event. So please sign up there, malfirstgroup.com forward slash launch. Uh, okay. Let's get into the benefits of sermon-based discussion groups. This is not the only way that people can do this. I mean, you could have not sermon-based discussion groups, right, AJ? Sure, yeah. That's And maybe that's even more commonly, I don't know, probably the churches I work with, that's more common, that uh, it is not, they yeah. don't have the whole church focused on the same thing. Yeah, you know, it's just easier to to find something that was already written by somebody else, um, packaged together for you. Um, maybe some of you have like a right now media subscription or something like that, where it's just easy for group leaders even to select their own thing. And I think there's some challenges to that, AJ. And, and one of the reasons why um, we are talking about this today is um, you, you really um, have, I don't want to say less control. That's my, maybe not control isn't the right word. But there's an element to that, but yeah, it's not, that's not the goal, but that is, that is a piece of it. Yeah. But you just, you don't really know what people are being taught if, unless you've really gone through and, and it's, it's really yeah. possible that you might, your people might be treading into territory. You don't really want them going into. And so for, yeah. um, for those reasons, we, th- we think if, if you can do sermon based groups, this is the way to go. We're going to explore three reasons why we think this is a, a good approach and a beneficial approach. So let's let's dive into those. Yeah, uh, the first one is unity in the church. Um, and this actually came up yesterday. I was having this discussion yesterday with one of the elders here uh, in Naples. And uh, and so we spent some time kind of talking about this because uh, they're, you know, they're going through our strategic visioning process and, and are going to be looking for ways to improve discipleship in the church. Mm-hmm. Unity in the church um, around what people are learning. Now, we get that, obviously, in our sermon, you know, when we go to our worship service and everything, we have that. But continuing that outside of that space, um, having everybody, you know, spending more time in the word, 
um, is definitely something uh, unifying. Now, in this, in the cultural context where I am, and you've got this where you are, Scott, because we're both working with international churches. Here, we've got language groups. We've got Italian and English in this church. And you've got mm-hmm. multiple languages in the church that you're at, though it's mostly English-based. Um, but So international churches around the world are all aware of these kinds of, of concerns and challenges. But even in the U.S., in a you know homogenous English-speaking church, having people focus on the same thing at the same time is a unifying thing. Um, and you know, there's two particular, I mean, you can find unity talk throughout scripture, but there's really two places of scripture that I, I really always go to when I think about unity in the church. And the first is in John chapter 17, when Jesus is praying to the father in heaven, um, for unity. And, and I love when you really kind of dig into this, where you look at verses 20 through 21, I'm just going to read it. Uh, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through the message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so the world may believe that you have sent me. Unity in the church, oneness in the church, oneness then with Christ, who is at one with the Father, is a demonstration to the world of who Christ is and how we relate to him. And he said that would indicate to them the love that he has. Um, and so when when the church is unified... <laughs> The world sees a picture of this relationship, and uh, and so I I think the study of God's word together helps drive that unity in the church. So um, and then one uh, another unity piece that I'm probably maybe people think of more often is in Ephesians chapter four, um, uh, when uh, it is spoken of in uh, around eleven twelve thirteen. Um, that we're looking for maturity. Well, first of all, that we'd be equipping people for the works, work in the ministry, um, but that we would reach maturity and unity um, through our maturity. So unity in the church is a significant thing. And I know we all, you know, as leaders in our churches, desire that um, and mm-hmm. strive for that. I think this, <laughs> now that we're going to turn this into our unity podcast, but I think this is an element that can help drive unity in the church. And I think what we've just seen in scripture demonstrates the benefits. Yeah. I think too, what you have often um, in churches is um, group shopping. So, well, what's this group studying? What's this Sunday school class studying? What's yeah, this, uh, that's a great point. this class. And so um, it doesn't become about the relationships as much as it does about the content. And so when you strip away that option, so to speak, then people are, um, you know, they're uniting in their group around the relationship and, and building that long-term accountability with the same group of people over a long time. I, I think that um, there is some benefit, I think, to having maybe standalone classes or groups that are short-term, that are focused on a different kind of a topic, that engage people who, who aren't already in a group um, or a class for the first time. You know, you're doing a we're going to do a six week thing, a class on marriage that we meets on Wednesday nights. But then we can we want to try and peel those people off from that short term class or group into the longer term uh, small group that, that meets with the same people over a long period of time. And in that environment, I think it's best to go with a sermon based group because then we're not centered. We're not um, shopping the all of the small groups based on content. Um, or, or per, putting that burden on the small group leader. There are a lot of people who they don't want to become a small group leader because they, they're like, I, I don't want to have to, uh, do all this prep and always be picking what, what curriculum we're going to be doing. That's a lot of pressure. So, um, to know, Hey, most That's of the point. preps happening on Sunday morning when I just show up and listen to the sermon, I've done, I've done the prep, uh, and I don't have to worry about picking the curriculum because I know we're doing, you know, what's, what's in the, in the, in the sermon. So, um, for all of those reasons, I'm with you. I think, I think it it creates some unity, some unity within the church broadly, some unity among the groups, some unity among the group leaders, um, so that they can rely on one another and, uh, learn from one another and even have those conversations like, um, how, how do people in your group respond to this? You know, 
Um, and to know that, uh, whenever I encounter anybody from my church, I can have a more nuanced or deeper conversation about the sermon with them. If they're, if assuming they're in a small group, because they also went deeper in it as well. So that, that driving that unity, I think is really important. So, um, Let's move on to number two. Yeah, number two, um, and I think this is pretty significant, and that is uh, predictable discipleship. So from a leadership standpoint in the church, one of the things that we should be expecting, that we should be striving for, is to have some level of confidence that the things that we're doing together as a church have positive outcomes. um, And Mm -hmm. the, you know, the... The function of the church is to, again, to equip people, to mature them in the faith. And so um, when we leave things very scattered, very unknown, how, how do we know that? How are we able to know that that's happening? And so speaking a little bit more again now, you know, in in the organized law groups or Sunday school or, you know, whatever your primary discipleship growth ministry might be that you're inviting people to participate in. As you just mentioned, Scott, if if that's just left to the group leader or some you know random choice that they that they might do, um, how do we really know what's what's happening there? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the quality of the study that might be happening, the knowledge base of the one that's leading or facilitating, are they answering you know tough questions maybe appropriately? Are they or you know are they able to at all? Um, and then you've got the variations. You, I mean, you mentioned group shopping a minute ago. I mean, sometimes that is just kind of relationship based. Um, you know, some people might prefer this group over here that's mostly fellowship. You know, they, mm. they might mm-hmm. do a little a Bible study a few times a year. They like to just hang out together and, and maybe pray for one another. And but another group is like very academic. They're all, you know, they're going deep in something, um, but they don't really do a lot of fellowshipping. And so people begin to make choices based on that which leaves part of our congregation gaining strength in one area of maturity and part of our congregation getting strength in maybe something else and not having more uniformity. So um, Mm -hmm. if we've got people studying the same thing um, with, I hate to use the word control, but, you know, I mean, controlling the content helps predictable outcomes. And and only by that is, is this is unity and maturity and growth and knowing that people are being taught well. Um, And so, you know, I think that's an important leadership aspect in the church that we would be able to confidently say, it doesn't matter which one of our groups or classes you choose, you are going to get the same experience and we are going to know that you're going to be, you're going to be built up through it. Yeah. uh, We, you and I have attended a lot of churches and um, Sunday school hours and things. And, uh, I'll occasionally ask the pastor, oh, which which uh, which group should I show up at? Which Sunday school class should right. I go to? And sometimes you'll see the pastor go, hmm, uh, you know, they're thinking through sort of the quality <laughs> of the classes <laughs> and the leaders, and they're right. trying to they're trying to make the best recommendation for you because they want you to see kind of what's what's working the best. I um I've shared this story before on the podcast, but I don't think it's for a very long time. You know, I was uh, working with the church, I won't say where, and uh, had this situation. I was wondering where should I go for uh, Sunday morning or Sunday school. And one, one group was recommended to me. They said, oh, this guy, I'll make up a name. I don't even remember what his name. Bob, Bob's been teaching for uh, 20 years. He's been teaching this class for 20 years. People love his class. And so I thought, okay, all right. So I go to Bob's class and Bob is just straight up teaching something that is not true out of the book of, out of the book of Genesis. I mean, demonstrably untrue. It was so easy to, to decipher that what he was saying was not true. It just, just good Bible study technique would have helped to uncover what he was saying was wrong. Um, and I, I didn't say anything in the class cause that would have been really inappropriate, but I was, I was pretty su- surprised and I went back to the elder who had recommended this class to me. And I said, when's the last time anybody checked up on Bob and what Bob <laughs> is teaching in Bob's class? And he said, well, we ha- we don't, we don't check on what, up on what Bob's teaching. He's been teaching it for 20 years. Okay. 
just because you've done something for 20 years doesn't mean you're doing a good job. Um, yeah. And Bob, Bob needed a little oversight. We'll just put it that way. So, yeah. yes, pr- predictable discipleship, you know, um, I suppose if you have someone using some boxed curriculum, you can have some measure of confidence that they are not mm-hmm. going to be teaching something that is just yeah, yeah. straight up false. You know, and in, in Bob's case, he was not using any curriculum. He was, it was just the curriculum of Bob. Um, but wouldn't it be better if you knew that the, the content they were going through, that each group was going through, is rooted in your theological perspective and mm-hmm. teaching the truth that you want people to be diving into. Um, yeah. I think that is so important. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, to some extent, when you kind of break this down, you're like, okay, here's a group of people. Here's somebody that's, uh, you know, leading them. We, we let them make all the decisions about how they're going to lead those people, the content, what they're going to teach. If you took, if you split that lens around, we might refer to that person as a, a pastor, an overseer, an elder. Yeah. You know, so we've got these people, small group leaders, Sunday school teachers that are not pastors, are not elders. And, um, but they have this responsibility of mm-hmm. deciding what people should learn, teaching it to people. And we just pretend like that's totally okay. And, you know, not that anybody can do it. No church would say that. But, um, but a lot of times there's, there is not a high level of vetting to that. And I think it's a very high responsibility that should be taken pretty seriously. Yeah. Yeah. So that, I mean, that doesn't mean every, every small group leader needs to have gone to seminary, obviously, No, right. but it does, it, but it does mean you, you, you need to take ownership of the aspects of that, that you can take ownership of. And one of those would be the content that they're teaching and covering. Yeah. Yeah. Um, All right. Yeah. So. Well, so our third point, you know, I mean, is has really kind of been unfolding as we've talked about this, and that is just simply deeper knowledge of Scripture. Um, we, mm-hmm. you know, we know sermon preparation has things that are edited out. Uh, there's mm-hmm. on the cutting room floor of the pastor's office are things that he wishes he could say, uh, but he just doesn't have time for that. There's so, so much richness in God's word. There's no way you can, you know, reveal every, every jot and tittle every week. And so um, this is a way to take that deeper aspect, probably that that he wishes mm-hmm. he had time for on Sunday, and let it be unpacked. I know that was true of, of a church that I spent, you know, many years in. You know, we had this this uh, this setup that we're talking about, and oh my gosh, you know, you can spend so much more time on the details. So uh, yeah, I think the church again in uniformity, gaining this deeper understanding of, you know, the nuanced things within a, a particular passage of scripture. It's just invaluable. Yeah, it, it really is. Like, like you said, there's so much there that's in the passage that you just can't cover. Um, but you could pass that information along into a small group study guide. Um, and it really would be valuable or, or sometimes you even have to skip whole, um, whole verses, you know, depending on how you've paced it. Um, you know, you might be going through a series and you're, you're having to cover a whole chapter a week or something. And so uh, you, you honed in on one thing because it, in the sermon, it narratively made more sense, but you didn't cover really everything in that chapter. And so, you know, in the, in this sermon based discussion guide, you can you can cover some of the, the the other aspects of that chapter that you just didn't get to cover in the sermon, or not to the degree that you wanted to. So, um, I think yes, uh, and maybe maybe most importantly, and we definitely have a bias here, you and I, um, but I think it's an okay one to have. Um, inherently, I think. This makes the, well, I don't know, I'm making an assumption here that maybe I shouldn't make, AJ, but I was going to say, if you were doing a sermon-based discussion guide, we are, by default, then pushing people deeper into Scripture and not and less into uh, just some m- more superficial topic. But I guess mm. that's not true. It depends on how, <laughs> how deep and Scripture-based are your, are your sermons? You know, if you're, if I your sermons so. are pretty superficial. 
Um, so, but I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking yeah. of our audience, and I think our audience is a group of people who love the Lord and love the Scripture, and and are preaching the Word faithfully. And uh, because I'm assuming that about you, I'm then also going to assume that if you were to do sermon based groups, that you would be you would be getting people deeper into the Scripture and not just into some superficial thing like. Three ways, three ways to be a better friend or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You and I certainly are defaulting to uh, more expository methodologies and, uh, and goals. So uh, that is, that's yeah. definitely the angle that we're talking about today for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, um, one thing that I want to hit on before we, we wrap this up, AJ, is that some of you who are listening to this, might be thinking, this would be great. I would love to do sermon-based groups, but the reason why we don't do it, the number one reason why we don't do it is I do not have the time to make a sermon-based discussion guide. I just, I don't have that kind of time. Um, and I'm, I'm a solo pastor, or maybe you're even a, um, a bivocational pastor. And, and so you, you really don't have the time and you don't have the help. Um, one of the resources in the Healthy Churches Toolkit is a uh, sermon discussion guide tool where you all you need to do is put in the name of your sermon, the title of your sermon, kind of the primary scripture that you're using. And then you can you can either paste in your uh, manuscript if if that's what you use, if you use a manuscript or even, or even a, a simple outline of your key points. If you just have bullet points, you can put those in to the tool. And then it's going to create uh, a study guide based on your key points. Um, it's like three, three to five questions for each of your key points. And it's going to make cross-references. Um, it'll, it'll generate an, an icebreaker question to go along with that, uh, as well as some application questions at the very end. Uh, it's, uh, we've been testing this tool um, for a long time now, and we're getting very consistent results in making sure that they're, it's really quality discussion guides. And, and of course, the beautiful thing is you can edit it to your heart's content. So um, take out a question you think is not very relevant or isn't very good or add your own. But now you're not going to need to spend you know, an hour or two hours. It can take you just a few moments um, yeah, to take yeah. the work you've already done. You you did the work. You did the hard work by putting that outline together, by putting that manuscript together. That was the hard work. Now let let our tool take that information and and turn that into a discussion guide uh, based on the hard work you already did. So it's just transforming your content. It's not inventing something. So um, uh, that's a that's. I think going to be a very valuable tool um, for people who are using the toolkit. Yeah, it's my favorite piece of the toolkit. It's what I'm actually most excited about. I can't wait for people to get in there and, and be using it. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I hope they'll do that. Malpersgroup.com slash launch to sign up for the launch event. And uh, that's just a couple of weeks away. So um, definitely jump in and do that. Uh, Scott, are we going to have a limit on the number that we can have in the launch event or are we not? Hmm. That's a good question. Stay tuned next week to, to for us to let you know if there's a limit to the number of people that we can have. <laughs> Based on the technology that we have available to us. <laughs> yeah. T TBD. Okay. No, we know, we know how we're going to do it, but I, I, I don't know that if there's a limit or not. So, okay. Um, All right. We'll check pretend that. that there is. Sign up for this thing as if there is a limit to the number of people who, who could show up. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, thanks for being with us, everybody. Uh, for uh, AJ in Naples and Scott in Madrid and uh, and the rest of our team around uh, North America and Europe, we're thankful that you listen to the Church Revitalization podcast and take advantage of the resources that we uh, try to bring for you. And uh, and we're we're just thankful that, uh, that you're just a part of the ministry and out there doing the work. And um, we're glad to be on the road to, out here doing it with you this time as well. Um, you can get yeah. more information about all of our ministries and, uh, and supporting our ministry that allows us to be out here doing this work at no cost to churches, uh, in various parts of the country, all at malfirstgroup.com. So, um, head over there and, uh, we'd love to hear from you on this topic or others in the future. Thanks for being with us. We love you. See you next time.